Welcome to the Texas Frontier. You are here in the midst of history, but as you head back east, you'll see that the entire region between Abilene and Fort Worth has rich tales to tell. Millions of people have now made the journey you are about to make. With Interstate 20, the path between Abilene and Fort Worth is an easy, beautiful drive. As you make the trip, you'll see interstate mile markers along the way. These will be your cue to listen to specific tracks on this CD. As you begin your journey in Abilene, the friendly frontier, you are in the northeast corner of Taylor County. The county is 917 square miles of prairie traversed by a line of hills stretching from the east to the west known as the Callahan Divide. The Brazos River Basin is to the north of these hills and the Colorado River Basin to the south. Until the 1870s, the region was still dominated by the Buffalo and Comanches, who tended to favor one gap in the hill that would later come to be called Buffalo Gap. It is in this live oak covered valley that the first permanent town was founded in 1874, the town of Buffalo Gap. Primarily attracting buffalo hunters, the town became the county seat in 1878 when the county was organized. Molly Clack came to Taylor County in 1879. She stood right on the current location of Abilene and described the scenery. The country was all open, just as the maker had fashioned it, not having been marred by any inventions of man, such as muddy lanes, impossible gates, and so on. A chain of purple mountains on the left raised their purple peaks majestically toward the sky. This chain was broken at intervals by defiles, or gaps, the most noted of these being Buffalo Gap, which was to be our future post office and trading point. In 1881, the Texas and Pacific Railroad bypassed Buffalo Gap and laid plans for a new town north of the county seat, Abilene. By 1883, citizens voted to move the county seat to this larger city. Abilene is still the largest city in the county, but the original Taylor County Courthouse, built in 1879, is still standing and open for visitors as a part of the Buffalo Gap Historic Village in beautiful Buffalo Gap. Abilene is a town of 116,000 people from all walks of life. Abilene's economy represents all of the things that have figured so prominently in the development of West Texas. Hardy pioneers, cowboys, the railroad, oil wildcatters, military men, preachers, teachers, schools, and churches. The city was started on a cold, blustery spring day in 1881 through an auction for lots along the new route of the Texas and Pacific Railroad. Historian Rupert Richardson. The new town had been created by the joint efforts of the cattlemen in the vicinity and the railroad. The cattlemen named the place Abilene after the cattle shipping town in Kansas that they knew so well and the railroad people proclaimed the Texas town the future great. By 1883, this future great city had incorporated and was home to two newspapers, numerous churches, and a public school. Today, the early history of settling this area is celebrated and passed down to future generations at a high-technology, interactive history experience museum named Frontier Texas, located in a limestone building that echoes the early forts and easily visible just as Highway 80 reaches Abilene's vibrant and beautifully maintained restored downtown. The facility sits on a lot that initially served Abilene as a buffalo boneyard. Early West Texas historian Wayne Gard. A huge pile of bones could usually be seen on North 1st Street, just east of Pine Street. There, sellers generally received $8 a ton, which meant about $3 a load. All through the summer and fall of 1881, Abilene dealers were busy shipping the white remainders of the vanished buffalo. Miss Tommy Clack, an early Taylor County resident, similarly recalls, My brother John used to make some spending money gathering and selling buffalo bones. I can recall making only one buffalo bone hunting trip. John hitched a team to the wagon and we drove over somewhere south of the Buffalo Gap and gathered bones all afternoon. More than a century after this boneyard had come and gone, Frontier Texas now also serves as the official Abilene and Texas Forts Trail Visitor Center, chock full of information about Abilene and a 69 county area. Admission to the Visitor Center is free. In the TNP Historic District, Beautifully restored railroad buildings now house offices, an event center, and a local and well-known candy maker, Vleda's Candies, a long-running family-owned business. 
Guests who step inside the National Center for Children's Illustrated Literature are shocked to learn that the beautiful gallery and activity center once served as a car garage. Today, the location celebrates children's first exposure to art, storybook illustrations, by displaying the original art created for award-winning children's books. At the nearby Grace Museum, world-class art exhibits, history, and children's museums occupy a building that once served travelers along the railroad. A co-op of local artists display their works at the Center for Contemporary Arts downtown, where admission is always free, if you can resist purchasing the art on display. The area's role as a training base for World War II soldiers is chronicled at the 12th Armored Division Memorial Museum downtown, a site where soldiers who fought in that division and others still reunite regularly for fellowship and recall their days training at Abilene's Camp Barkley. The beautiful Spanish colonial revival-style Paramount Theater still shows live productions, classic and contemporary movies, while the first hotel that ever bore the name of the world-famous hotelier Conrad Hilton now operates as apartments in the beautifully restored Windsor Building, where the ballroom where Lawrence Welk once played is still used for glamorous events. Today, apartment buildings, numerous restaurants, art galleries, retail shops, and bustling offices keep Abilene's downtown full of life. On the second Thursday of each month, downtown venues and vendors stay open late to celebrate Art Walk. The streets bustle with the sounds of street musicians, vendors, and children who take part in activities at the arts venues, where the admission is always free during that evening. Abilene's downtown is a lovely metaphor for the heritage of this area. It's a place where history collides with the contemporary, a city that celebrates its western roots while blossoming into a progressive cultured city on the Texas frontier. Stop the CD and drive on to Interstate 20 and head east. Once you get to mile marker 299, start the CD again on track 2. Exits 299 to 301 will put you in the town of Clyde. The town is situated on the Callahan Divide, the boundary between the Brazos and Colorado River Valleys. The town is also situated directly over an aquifer, providing steady irrigation for farming and ranching in the area. Permanent settlers first moved into the area in 1876, but it would take the building of the Texas and Pacific Railroad into the area in 1880 to make settlement assured. Clyde was not originally going to be one of the towns created by the railroad. However, in 1880, nearly 5,000 railroad construction workers were camped at the location and the construction camp foreman, Robert Clyde, had pitched a large tent in the camp in which he kept supplies. Workers would frequently be heard saying, Let's go up to Clyde's when they needed materials, and the name stuck. Numerous settlers came to the location, and the town of Clyde was born. In 1883, several Irish families moved to Clyde from Pennsylvania. A year later, 10 Portuguese families from California also arrived in the area and established a colony near Clyde. Their hope was to start a vineyard and produce wine, but their arrival coincided with one of the coldest winters of record followed by a few years of severe drought. They abandoned the colony around 1900. By the 20th century, Clyde had a growing population and was enjoying success as a regional farming community. In 1926, the aquifer-fed fruits and vegetables from Clyde were so popular in other regions that they earned the town the nickname the California of Texas. Also in the mid-1920s, oil production added to the town's economy. Today, Clyde is still a bustling town of more than 3,000 residents, and people still travel there to buy fresh produce. Stop the CD and begin track three when you see mile marker 306. The next town you are approaching is Baird, the county seat of Callahan County. Like many of the towns through which you will pass, it was established when the Texas and Pacific Railway came through in 1880. The post office, established first as Vickery in 1881, was renamed Baird in 1883 after railroad surveyor and engineer Matthew Baird, and the new community served as a division point on the railroad with a depot, roundhouse, and repair shops. 
Justice Abilene replaced Buffalo Gap as the county seat of Taylor County. Baird replaced Belle Plain as county seat of Callahan County in 1883, and by doing so, gained most of the former county seat's population. Eventually, the town even got the old limestone courthouse, a smaller version of Buffalo Gap's, when the residents moved it stone by stone from the ghost town of Belle Plain. Industries in Baird have included gins, flour mills, and a feed mill. The county hospital is in Baird, and the town is the center for local oil field supplies and ranching. Passersby can also see an early 20th century oil refinery once owned by legendary oil man J.R. Parton, the man who lent his name to the better known J.R. Ewing of television's Dallas fame. At mile marker 307, you'll encounter the intersection of U.S. Highway 281, stretching all the way from near Kearney, Nebraska to Coleman, Texas, one county south of here. Just south of Baird, about six miles and just about a mile east of U.S. 283, sits the ghost town of Belle Plaine. The doomed town appeared to have a bright future at its founding in 1876, but it would cease to exist a few decades later. The town was named for the first child born at the site, Katie Bell McGee. By the summer of 1876, several people had moved to the town, which boasted three businesses, including a saloon. In 1877, Callahan County formally organized, and Bell Plain won out as the county seat over its main competitor, Callahan City. As the county seat, Bell Plain attracted several more citizens. It boasted a population of nearly 400, including four doctors and 11 lawyers. It also had several stores and saloons, a stone jail, and a newspaper, the Callahan County Clarington. Perhaps the greatest pride of the town was the Belle Plain College. The town had evolved in only a few years into a regional supply center and a major exporter of cotton, wheat, and buffalo hides. Early Belle Plain resident C.F. Annis explains what happened to his town. Formerly, Frontiersmen rode 50 miles from the northwest to Belle Plaine to inquire of the mail. The nearest other post offices at that period were at Comanche and Fort Griffin. The town that was started with so much promise met its fate from the concurrence of two calamities. In 1881, the engineers for the T&P Railway, seeking an easy way to bring the line to the plateau, chose a gulch some miles to the northward, leaving the town to perish as dozens of other towns have done in the opening of the West. In the winter of 84-85, cattle and sheep, the principal and almost the only source of revenue in the entire region, died by the thousands, bringing panic and uncertainty to many families and actual distress to others. These two misfortunes were followed by a third. 1886 and 1887 were as dry as the worst years ever known in that dry region. So hereby hangs a tale, short and tragic. The bottom fell out, mortgages were foreclosed, and the end came quietly. Stop the CD and begin track four at mile marker 330. At mile marker 330, you're coming into Cisco, one of the major towns of Eastland County. It began as the community of Red Gap in 1878. Just two years later, the Texas and Pacific Railroad was built nearby and some considered moving the town to be along the tracks. What since the idea was the building of the Houston and Texas Central Railway in 1881. Residents of Red Gap moved into the intersection of the two rail lines and changed the name of their town to Cisco to honor John Cisco, the New York financier responsible for the building of the Houston and Texas Central Railroad. Cisco's population grew quickly, influenced by the transportation bonanza of two rail lines. In its early years, as businesses began to spring up, the town fell victim to outlaws. In 1887, four men rode into town on a cold January day and they robbed a bank of about $5,000. As the brazen bank robbers headed out of town, a few men tried to follow, firing rounds at the fleeing bandits. The robbers' response to these shots, however, was to stop their horses, hold their bags of money in the air, and to taunt the posse to try to follow them. The bandits then carried on, running into some farmers making their way into town. They told the farmers, Tell those town folk that we'll be back to clean out the town later. 
This threat had the people of Cisco terrified. Texas Lieutenant Governor Thomas B. Wheeler lived in Cisco at the time. So he sent a telegram to Governor Saul Ross stating, Bank robbed. Robbers threaten to return and rob the town. What can be done? The governor, a former Texas Ranger and Indian fighter, sent back a quick reply. If not enough men in town to protect it, burn and evacuate. The robbers never return, so the town was spared. The town continued to thrive after this, and Cisco was also deeply influenced by the oil boom of the late 1910s. Hundreds of people flocked to Cisco and Ranger during this period to seek their fortunes. One of these men was named Conrad Hilton. He arrived in Cisco with the intention of buying a local bank, which was a sound investment in that boom period. He was frustrated to find out, however, that the bank owner had gone back on the price that the two had agreed on. He became more annoyed by the fact that he couldn't find a place to sleep that night. He learned that Henry Mobley, owner of Cisco's Mobley Hotel, was leasing every bed in his place for eight-hour shifts. This fact convinced Hilton that there were other ways to make money in an oil boom, and he bought the Mobley on the spot. This would become the first hotel in what later would become the international chain owned by the Hilton family. Today, the Hilton Foundation has paid to renovate the Mobley, and it serves as the home of the Cisco Chamber of Commerce, Museum, Park, and Community Center. Once the oil boom ended, Cisco was still in for more excitement. This time, it was another brazen bank heist, the Santa Claus Bank Robbery on December 23, 1927. Mass Gumbin entered the First National Bank and got away with more than $12,000 cash and more than $150,000 in securities. The large amount taken, however, was not as significant as the technique used to carry off the job. One of the robbers, a former resident of Cisco, walked into the lobby of the bank dressed as Santa Claus. Being only two days before Christmas, the man was immediately surrounded by children and parents. While this distraction was going on, the other members of the gang slipped into the lobby. The bank cashier, Alex Spear, did not notice the other men because he was looking at the happy customers enjoying the visit from old St. Nick. He even yelled out, Well, hello, Santa Claus! Just as he uttered these words, however, the rest of the robbers were standing at the teller windows demanding all the money and securities. Two police officers were only a block away, and they arrived on the scene as robbers were dashing to their cars. The robbers grabbed two little girls from the bank and used them as shields. Unable to fire toward the hostages, both officers were gunned down. Eventually, the gang was captured after some harrowing chases. They stood trial for the crime and were sentenced to death. The gang's ringleader, Marshall Ratliff, however, tried to have his charges reversed by reason of insanity. Longtime Eastland County resident Edwin T. Cox. Ratliff was transferred to the penitentiary at Huntsville and placed in a death cell. There, he played the insanity dodge so well that he was returned to Eastland County and placed in jail. He continued to act crazily. When pricked with a needle while pretending paralysis, he would not flinch, and for days at a time, he would eat nothing but filth. Ratliff was only stalling for time, and soon he overpowered a guard and stole his pistol. Ratliff gunned down Deputy Tom Jones, but was apprehended before he could escape. Cox recalled what happened next, once the town people heard of Deputy Jones' fate. That night, a multitude of men and boys, no one of which could remember the presence of any other, took Ratliff out of the jail and hung him to a telephone guy wire nearby. This brought to an end the story of the infamous Santa Claus bank robbery. Stop the CD and begin track 5 at mile marker 340. Highway 6 north from the interstate will take you into Eastland. Founded in 1875, this town soon became the county seat for Eastland County. One Eastland resident, town founder C.U. Connolly, had come to the region as a buffalo hunter, and he lived a long and fruitful life. Newspaperman Boyce House described Connolly's contributions. He built his log cabin home and laid out the town of Eastland. As it grew, Connolly, landowner and businessman, was its wealthiest citizen. When oil was found and the hamlet became a city of 10,000, he was one of the big four, without whose backing no civic move was launched. 
Connolly built a racetrack and grandstand, and in partnership with United States Senator Joseph W. Bailey, raised racehorses. Almost on the spot where his cabin had stood, the Connolly Theater was built, the largest show house between Fort Worth and El Paso. On this stage, the greatest sensation was the visit of the passing show from the New York Winter Garden. Oil millionaires loaded the beautiful chorus girls into limousines to see the sights of the oil fields, the climax being a sumptuous dinner at which wine flowed freely. Indian perils, buffalo hunting, the building of a village into a city where Broadway attractions were seen, all this C.U. Connolly witnessed in the span of his active lifetime. In the midst of this boom and ultimate bus story, Eastland had one other resident far more famous than C.U. Connolly, Old Rip the Horny Toad. His story began in 1897, when Eastland residents built the third county courthouse. One of the items they placed in the cornerstone was a reptile found aplenty in the region at the end of the 19th century, the horned lizard. In 1928, the county demolished the courthouse to make way for a new one. They announced they were going to open the cornerstone. 3,000 spectators showed up to see the contents of the time capsule. To the amazement of the crowd, when the workers held aloft the dusty lizard, its leg moved. It was still alive after 31 years entombed. Many skeptics claim the lizard had been replaced for the crowd, but others dubbed the creature Old Rip after Rip Van Winkle. Soon Eastland gained national fame as the country learned of this miraculous reptile. Old Rip went on a tour of the nation, even stopping in Washington, D.C. to meet President Calvin Coolidge. In early 1929, Old Rip died and the people of Eastland had him embalmed and placed in a red velvet lined box in the courthouse lobby for all to see. Old Rip's fame continued long after his death. In 1962, Texas gubernatorial candidate John Connolly campaigned in Eastland. Sensing a publicity opportunity, he asked to be photographed with Old Rip. Unfortunately, Connolly lifted the mummified reptile by its hind leg, which promptly fell off. One final note about Old Rip, his story has also been immortalized in American pop culture. In 1955, cartoonist Chuck Jones had heard about the story of Old Rip in Eastland, so he created a cartoon called One Froggy Evening, which featured a frog freed from a cornerstone who sings ragtime jazz when no one is watching. That cartoon transitioned into the character Michigan J. Frog, which is the official mascot of the Warner Brothers Television Network. Stop the CD and begin track six at mile marker 349. As you approach the town of Ranger, its law and order sounding name belies its rough and tumble history. It was originally named for an 1870s Texas Ranger camp in a valley about two miles northeast of Ranger on a prong of Palo Pinto Creek at the south end of the present Hageman Lake. Carrie Lavina Smith Langston recalled the incident that gave the town its name. Many, many years ago, before the valleys of Eastland had ever felt the thrill and jar of rumbling cars, or her heels had echoed the shrill cries of an engine, the Indians found and utilized a magnificent rendezvous a few miles east of Ranger. After one of their usual raids, the Indians fled to this canyon, now so famous for its rugged beauty, and were followed by the Texas Rangers, than whom no class of men have done more for Texas. These poorly fed and poorly paid guardians of life and property on the frontier drove the Indians on this occasion from their lair. On emerging from the deep and ragged gorge, the rangers found themselves in a beautiful, level valley of richest soil and luxuriant grasses. By 1879, the peaceful little valley housed a tent city with tent churches, schools, hotel, and general store, and was known as Ranger Camp Valley. 
But in 1880, the Texas and Pacific Railway Company laid tracks a couple of miles west, and the inhabitants left their tranquil paradise in favor of the railway settlement and established the permanent town of Ranger on December 27, 1880. Settlers occasionally had reminders that they were in the wild. One early Ranger settler, Sarah Higgins, recalled, Adolphus Langlitz heard a whistling sound one night outside his home. He decided to investigate and crept out into the darkness where repeated sounds led him to a tree. When he got near the tree, he saw two shining eyes. His first thought was to make a grab and catch it. This he did and had his arms full of something he could not turn loose. In his helpless plight, he looked up only to see a mother panther looking savagely down upon him. Quick as a flash, he flung the kitten in his arms upon the ground with all his might and gave one mighty leap and bound for distance. The mother panther sprang down and hesitated only long enough to see that her baby was alive. Adolphus could tell the beast was gaining on him. An old hearsay popped into his mind. A panther will always stop and tear up anything that it catches. While running, his coat was peeled off and sailed backward. He came to a high fence and got over it. He knew not how. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the coat had landed on the head of the panther and had covered her face. With the coat to tear up and the fence between him and the panther, Adolphus had won the race and had speed to spare. Moments later, he heard the panther scream. The drought of 1917 nearly ruined Ranger, and it faced extinction. A few enterprising men asked William Knox Gordon, a vice president of the Texas Pacific Coal and Oil Company, to begin testing their failing farms and lots for oil. The first well drilled, the Nanny Walker No. 1, proved lackluster. But in October 1917, the McCleskey No. 1 came in, reached a daily production of 1,700 barrels, setting off an oil boom that drastically changed Ranger and Eastland County forever. The Ranger oil strike almost single-handedly led the oil industry back to Texas. Oil field newspaperman Boyce House recalled, Within a short time after the McCleskey was completed, Ranger became a city of 30,000 people who lived mainly in shacks and tents. Wells making 5,000 to 10,000 barrels a day were almost commonplace. Numerous farmers who had had a hard struggle for years suddenly found themselves with incomes of thousands of dollars a month. Just when the oil began flowing, steady rainfall turned Main Street into a three-foot bog. One resident even reported seeing a mule drown in the mud. The rains, coupled with crowded and poorly built housing, led to an epidemic of typhoid and influenza, killing many, including J.H. McCleskey, who never got to enjoy the riches his well touched off. The oil industry itself nearly destroyed the town. Photographs from the boom show derrick sprouting up throughout the town, dooming residents to breathing, smelling, and tasting oil. Ranger historian Ruth Terry Denny recalled that the Nellie Walker No. 1 well had never been covered up in the excitement of McCluskey's success. Although the Walker well had been abandoned, it was not forgotten, because the gas flow had steadily increased from the open and unguarded hole. While the business of the town rushed by, a casual eye was still cast toward the big wooden derrick. In the meantime, it dozed in the sun while its towering, lifeless shape made it look like some weird but not particularly vicious prehistoric animal. Then suddenly, on the night of January 1st, 1918, it came to life with a thundering, exploding sound. The next morning, the valley in which the town stood was filled with millions of cubic feet of wet gas. Another problem was that when these wells came in, as they often did, caught fire and the whole town was in jeopardy. One 1919 fire destroyed nearly two city blocks. At mile marker 351, travelers will see the road to Desdemona. This sleepy little town is one of the oldest Texas settlements west of the Brazos River, founded sometime around 1857, when a group of settlers built a family fort for protection from the Indians. Folks there mainly made their living from trade and peanut farming, and local politics centered on rivalries between populist-era socialists and Democrats who gathered annually for a picnic and baseball game. By 1904, some 340 called Desdemona home. 
All that changed in September 1918 when Tom Dees, director of the recently formed Hog Creek Oil Company, struck oil on land owned by Joe Duke and put Desdemona among the growing number of oil boom towns in Eastland County. Almost overnight, speculators, small operators, and workers flooded in, and the town transformed into a jungle of tents and shacks housing 16,000 transient workers. The arrival of torrential rains turned Desdemona, like nearby Ranger, into an incubator for influenza and typhoid, where oil spills poison streams or vaporized into nasty clouds, making once peaceful Desdemona nearly unlivable. Because Desdemona was not located on a railroad, the muddy surroundings meant oil field workers had to rely on the age-old transportation standard, horses. Edwin T. Cox recalled, when oil was discovered at Desdemona, the very heavy wet season of 1919 was on and it became a problem hard to handle. Many heavy horse teams were brought in, some of which were valued at $600 or more per span, with an almost equal amount invested in the harnesses they wore. In the Desdemona area, several strings of oxen were used to drag the boiler-laden wagons through the almost impassable Leon Lowlands. As many as 600 oil field wagons loaded with equipment for drilling oil wells and material for derricks were sent out of Eastland. Of course, there were also the gambling dens, whorehouses, and attending violence. In April 1920, the Texas Rangers came to the oil-rich pest hole to keep order. When the oil boom ended, the town nearly went away. In 1936, the city government dissolved itself and the school closed in 1969, and now only 180 people remain. At this point, you're probably descending Ranger Hill, part of an uplift that can be followed across Texas and expressed as the hill country near Austin. Travelers rarely realize that Fort Worth is nearly a thousand feet lower than Abilene, but all recognize this dramatic shift in scenery as a landmark on their trip. In the distance lie the Brazos Mountains of the Valley of the Brazos River. Stop the CD and begin track seven at mile marker 367. Nearly a ghost town today, Thurber once had a population of perhaps as many as 10,000 and was the principal bituminous coal mining town in Texas. William Whipple Johnson, an engineer for the Texas and Pacific Railway, discovered the coal deposits in the mid-1880s and began mining operations in December 1886. A poor supply of skilled labor forced the operators to recruit miners from other states and from overseas. Large numbers of workers came from Italy, Poland, the United States, Britain, and Ireland, with smaller numbers coming from Mexico, Germany, France, Belgium, Austria, Sweden, and Russia. This cosmopolitan force of predominantly foreign workers spoke little or no English and enabled the company to maintain strict control over its employees. Early Palapento County resident, Mary Watley Clark. Many immigrants from Europe came to Palapinto County in the 1880s and 90s to work in the numerous coal mines on the south side. Among them were many Italian citizens. The village of Mingus was composed almost entirely of Italians at one time. These new Texans worked hard and were loyal to their new country. In time, all of them desired to become American citizens, especially the younger ones. My father, C.V. Watley, was district clerk in the early years of the 20th century and helped many of those citizens with their naturalization papers. On one occasion, he went to Mingus and naturalized 111 foreigners at one time. The price to become naturalized was $1 per person. Half of this fee went to the state. After the Oath of Allegiance had been administered that evening, the newly made citizens celebrated with a banquet, making Mr. Watley the honored guest. Mr. Watley always carried the Mingus box in all his political races, as these adopted citizens never forgot his kindness. With all the growth potential in the coal mines at Thurber and Mingus, the Texas and Pacific Coal Company purchased the mines in 1889. Historian J.C. Cohen. One of the members of the first directorate of the Texas and Pacific Coal Company was H.K. Thurber of New York. His name was given to this settlement, which was destined to become one of the most hectic mining towns in the nation. 
After the newly organized company took over in 1889, mine after mine was open. The camp grew into a thriving community, while company stores grew into large mercantile establishments. The railroad spur into Thurber from the Texas and Pacific Main Line was burdened with such heavy traffic that it was necessary to lay many miles of side tracks and to keep maintenance crews at Thurber at all times. The new owners feared the rise of organized labor and instead created a self-contained community and mining complex including schools, churches, saloons, stores, houses, an opera house seating over 650, a 200-room hotel, an ice and electric plant, and the only library in the county. In addition to the mines, the company operated commissary stores where the poorly paid workers could buy goods on credit or with company script. In 1897, a large brick plant came to town using clay from the company property. Its smokestack still stands as a landmark south of the freeway. Armed guards, a barbed wire fence, and stockade enclosures kept outsiders, including labor organizers, peddlers, and merchants, out of town. William Knox Gordon became the new manager of the Thurber properties at the turn of the century and at first continued the established policies. Before long, though, the United Mine Workers attempted to unionize the Thurber mines. In September 1903, more than 1,600 men joined the Thurber local of the UMW, as well as the local unions of carpenters, brick makers, clerks, meat cutters, and bartenders. Gordon reached an agreement with these organizers, resulting in harmonious labor management relations and gained Thurber recognition as the only 100% closed shop city in the nation. Thurber remained a union stronghold until the demise of mining operations in the 1920s when railroad locomotives converted to oil from coal. During the height of the coal boom, however, there was plenty of activity in Thurber and in the town of Mingus just to the north. John Spratt, who grew up in Mingus in the early 20th century, remembered. Well, the coal company used burrows deep in the mine and above ground to pull the cars. The animals working underground lived there. They drew loaded coal cars along a narrow track to the cage where they were then lifted to the surface. About 1910, the company replaced the burrows with electric generators. Power lines were run down the shaft and along the drifts to drive the electric cars to haul the coal out. That meant that every boy in Mingus, except my brother Harry and me, soon had a donkey. It was great fun to take off down the road while perched on the rump of a galloping burrow. We pleaded for our own donkey, but our pleas were ignored. Maybe Dad reasoned that two jackasses around the place were good enough. Adding a four-legged one would be just too much. Thurber declined almost in direct proportion to the vitality of the nearby oil boom, and workers steadily left town in the 1920s. By the end of 1927, no union miners remained in Texas. The brick plant continued on until 1930, a general office until 1933, and commissary stores until 1935. But on the eve of World War II, Thurber had become a virtual ghost town. The best place to see Thurber brick is Fort Worth, Camp Bowie Boulevard, a scenic stretch of road leading from Fort Worth's cultural district is paved with bricks, the first of which came from the Thurber plant. Visitors can learn more about this region by visiting the nearby W.K. Gordon Center for Industrial History of Texas. Tarleton State University Foundation built the center and with support and assistance from Mrs. W.K. Gordon Jr. of Erath County and the Texas Department of Transportation. The focus of the W.K. Gordon Center is the development of coal, brick, and petroleum industries in the Thurber area. A special collections library and research area permits serious examination of life in Thurber and other areas of industrial development in Texas and the Southwest. A few miles east sits the town of Gordon. In 1880, the Texas and Pacific Railroad founded the town of Gordon, named for one of its own engineers, H.L. Gordon. In the spring of 1881, the first train to travel the new tracks was pulling several flat cars and making its way toward the end of the line at the town. The 200 Irish railroad workers at the site looked expectantly at the train loaded with their supplies. Also watching the progress of this train were two cowboys, Jeff Cowden and Ed Bell, as they sat on their horses near the south fork of the Palo Pinto Creek. Cowden looked at Bell and proclaimed, Ed! Nothing like that can go through this county without being rope. <laughs> go to it. If you don't, I will. Cowden spurred his horse, coiled his rope, and landed the lasso perfectly around the smokestack of the engine. 
The engineer pushed on with a little extra steam, causing the rope to catch fire and fall away. The Irish workman watched the whole event and soon told the story far and wide about the wild Texas cowboy who roped the first T&P train coming into Gordon, Texas. The town would have other excitement related to its railroad in years to come. It would be the site of the notorious bandit Rude Burrow's second major train robbery. Burrow, a native of Alabama, became one of the most widely known bandits in the South and Southwest in the late 1880s. He committed his first robbery in East Texas in December 1886, and his second major robbery came a month later in January 1887, when he held up the TMP train at Gordon. He made away with more than $4,000 from the baggage express car that day. That Gordon robbery also set the stage for Burroughs' train robbing technique over the next few years. He would sneak onto the engine at night as it pulled away from the station. Then he forced the engineer at gunpoint to stop when the express car was on solid ground and the passenger car was stranded over a trestle. He soon became so proficient at robbing trains using this Gordon method that it's reputed that one TNP engineer upon being robbed one night asked Burrell, where do you want me to stop this time? Burrell replied, same place. Because of its location on the railroad, Gordon continued to thrive over the decades as an agricultural and market shipping center. Throughout most of the 20th century, and even into the 21st, Gordon's population has remained between 400 and 500 residents. Stop the CD and begin track 8 at mile marker 391. At mile marker 391, you'll see the exit for Gilbert Pitt Road. Just south of the interstate here is the famous Millsap Sandstone Quarries. Fine sandstone pavers as well as gravel for roadways come from quarries in this area. The town of Millsap, located just north of the interstate past the river, has lent its name to the sandstone that comes from here. As you cross the Brazos, a quick look to the left reveals the old US-80 bridge with its classic metal trestles, while a short canoe ride downstream would take you among mammoth, gravel, and sand mining operations. In the late 1950s, Texas writer John Graves took a November canoe trip on the Brazos only with a shotgun and a dachshund. Paddling from Possum Kingdom Dam to beyond Granbury in an epic journey he later wrote as goodbye to a river. When he reached the point near where US-80 crossed the river, just to the left of where I-20 makes the same traverse today, he hitched a ride to a nearby convenience store to restock on supplies and to make one of his periodic phone calls to check in with friends and family. He let me out at a brightly lighted service station grocery. I went into the Sir Stay Grow. They're institutional in that part of the world. Some, for variations, label themselves as Grow Market Stay or Grow Stay or whatnot. Three or four philosophers in bib overalls with brown juice in the corner of their mouths regarded me as I dumped the pup on the floor. Countrymen are not usually fond of dogs indoors, but I was tired of carrying him and I didn't trust him alone outside on the highway. Stop the CD and begin track 9 at mile marker 402. The town of Weatherford, settled in the 1850s, was named for the state senator of this district, Jefferson Weatherford of Dallas. According to his cousin, Senator Weatherford never set foot in the town that bears his name. The first settlers to the region had arrived less than 10 years earlier, but soon came by the hundreds using this town as their jumping off point for travels further west. This was dangerous country, and scores of fights between Indians and whites made life here tenuous. You can find several headstones in Parker County that read, Killed by Indians. The Texas and Pacific Railroad arrived in June of 1880 with great fanfare, and a second line, the Santa Fe, arrived in 1908. In 1895, the town's newspaper, the Weatherford Democrat, began and remains in operation today. Weatherford has a rich Western heritage filled with colorful characters. Legendary cattle drover Oliver Loving is buried here in Weatherford's Greenwood Cemetery. After being attacked by Indians in New Mexico in 1867, Loving's dying wish to his friend Charles Goodnight was to be buried in his home, Parker County. Goodnight brought the body back 600 miles by wagon for burial. Now, if this story sounds familiar, it should. It's the inspiration behind Texas author Larry McMurtry's novel, Lonesome Dove. 
A year earlier, Charles Goodnight had invented the first chuck wagon, which catered fixins for the cowboys on a cattle drive that would later become known as the Goodnight Loving Trail. Bose Ickard, who served with Goodnight and for whom the character Dietz was modeled, was also laid to rest in the Greenwood Cemetery. Weatherford has a rich cultural history as well. Weatherford resident Ellen Bowie Holland recalled her childhood in the town in the early 20th century. It was so thrilling to find that a dog and pony show and a street carnival with glass blowers, sideshows, and flying jennies regularly visited Weatherford. The town was also on the Chautauqua circuit, which annually spread its tent. But the pièce de résistance was the Haynes Opera House. There were Shakespeare plays, magicians, blackface minstrels, and home talent was thoroughly explored. About the time the Opera House was in full swing, Weatherford also became the birthplace and was home to Mary Martin, who later became an internationally known Broadway star, renowned for her portrayal of the beloved Peter Pan. Her son, Larry Hagman, became a famous TV star, forever immortalized as the villainous J.R. Ewing of the television melodrama Dallas. Larry Hagman was just as fond of Weatherford as his mother was and made appearances for special occasions and to help many Weatherford charities. At exit 406, you'll see the Old Dennis Road. If you were to travel southwest on this road for about five miles, you would arrive at the small town of Dennis on the Brazos River. In 1892, when a bridge was built across the Brazos at the spot, Judge N. M. Dennis established the town on the location to serve area farmers and ranchers. It has remained a small community ever since. A few miles south of Dennis on Farm Road 1189 will bring you to Buckner Road. Just east of this road lies the town of Buckner, originally called Big Valley. Residents eventually changed the name to commemorate a personal tragedy that occurred to one of their own, J. M. Buckner, in the 1870s. Early Parker County resident and historian G. A. Holland. Buckner, a village in Parker County on the south side of the Brazos River, was named in honor of J. M. Buckner, who, with his boy, was drowned in the Brazos River many years ago. They were drowned while fording the Brazos River in Hood County. A strange coincidence occurred. They were in a new wagon drawn by a pair of mules. The wagon bed was tight like a new boat. The river was past the fording stage and drifted the wagon and team with the turbulent waters. But the wagon bed floated the entire wagon and the mules swam with the current and reached the shore safely. Thinking it impossible for the team to swim, Buckner attempted to swim to shore. And when last seen, he was trying to hold his son above the water. Had he remained in the wagon, it is possible both would have been saved. To honor their fallen friends, Residents of Big Valley changed the name of their community to Buckner. It remains a small town today along the Brazos River in southwestern Parker County. At exit 407, you will see Tin Top Road. About five miles south on this road is the community of Tin Top. The town had previously been called Smith and then Irby in honor of local farming and ranching families. But it earned its more unique moniker because of a cotton gin built there in 1909. The new building had a galvanized metal roof that could be seen for miles. So people simply began referring to the community as Tin Top. In 1949, the town formally organized as Tin Top, drawing together residents of the nearby communities of Balch, Hightower, and Horseshoe Bend. The Tin Top Suspension Bridge, which spanned the Brazos River, was once on the National Register of Historic Places, but it no longer exists. The remains of that bridge, however, are easily visible from the new bridge built nearby. Stop the CD and begin track 10 at mile marker 418. As you enter the incorporated city of Willow Park, you're in a location where the history of transportation has dictated its existence. For instance, in the 1850s, this area was the location of the route of the Butterfield Overland Stage. By the late 1850s, it became the major path through which settlers to Parker County came. After the Civil War, a regular stage route from Fort Worth to Weatherford and beyond wound through this area. In 1878, this stage line became victim to the infamous Sam Bass Outlaw Gang right in this location. The gang hid along the banks of Mary's Creek, which is right near the Parker-Tarrant County line, when the stagecoach rumbled its way toward them. Slowing near the creek bank, the masked outlaws surrounded it 
and ordered everyone to dismount. Bass lined up the five passengers and searched them for cash. One of the passengers, Farmer Benjamin Williams, told Bass that he was just a hard-working man who couldn't afford to be robbed. Bass returned Williams $5, not knowing that Williams actually had $400 in cash hidden in a pair of gloves. Nevertheless, the Bass gang made their escape, and Sam Bass later recalled that he got $70 and three watches from that robbery. After this stage robbery on Mary's Creek, Bass exclaimed, Well, this is the best haul I ever made out of a stage, and I've tapped nine of them so far. There's mighty poor pay on stages generally, though. This area would continue to be influenced by transportation. In 1925, the Bankhead Highway made its way through the sparsely populated farms of eastern Parker County. In 1940, the double-laned Highway 80 took its place. In commemoration of this new road, locals built a pond among the grove of willow trees for picnickers coming from Fort Worth or Weatherford. In 1963, 32 residents petitioned to incorporate the city of Willow Park, named in commemoration of the roadside scenic pond area. In 1968, Interstate 20 came through the center of town of Willow Park, obliterating the namesake park. Nevertheless, the city still remains a popular place to live with access to Lake Weatherford and proximity to both Fort Worth and Weatherford. Stop the CD and begin track 11. After you have passed the I-20, I-30 split at mile marker 4, 21. You'll have to decide whether you will stay on I-20 or switch to I-30 in your eastward migration. Either route will take you to Fort Worth, where the West begins. This name goes back to the 1840s, when it was thought that this area would be a dividing line between the area becoming occupied by new settlers and the Indians to the West. In 1849, the U.S. Army established Fort Worth on the bluff which is now occupied by the beautifully restored Tarrant County Courthouse on Main Street. Simon B. Farrar, a soldier present at the founding of the fort, described that day. We started in company with Major Arnold in command up the Trinity River in search of a place to locate the regular United States troops. We passed through the cross timbers, crossing the different creeks as best we could through a wild and beautiful country inhabited only by Indians, wild Mustang horses, innumerable quantities of deer, wolves, and wild turkeys. As you approach Loop 820, you have an opportunity to go north to visit the Texas Civil War Museum. Opened in January of 2006, the museum has more than 15,000 square feet of exhibits and boasts as being the largest Civil War museum west of the Mississippi. In it, you will learn about Texas' role in its terrible conflict that tore the nation apart. You will also learn about notable Texans who served in the war, such as early Fort Worth citizen General K.M. Van Zant, who served with the 7th Texas in Tennessee. After the war, Van Zant returned to his East Texas home of Marshall, where he became frustrated with what he termed the many carpetbaggers and undesirable characters who had come to his hometown. He set out with four friends to relocate to Fort Worth. Van Zandt eventually became president on one of the earliest successful banks in Fort Worth, and the mansion that he eventually built as his home is still standing in the city's cultural district. As you enter into the downtown area of the city, you'll notice the restored horse fountain at the corner of Weatherford and Commerce. A drive around the 1895 courthouse covers part of the original grounds of the old fort. It was used by the Army only until 1853, when the line of U.S. forts moved further west. As soon as the Army left, settlers began using the old fort buildings and grounds to begin the settlement that today is the city of Fort Worth. This history can be reviewed at a comprehensive historical display at Fire Station No. 1 at 2nd and Commerce Streets. A drive south on Main Street from the courthouse takes you through the redeveloped area called Sundance Square. Named for Butch Cassidy's sidekick, the Sundance Kid, who visited Old Fort Worth and even had that famous photograph taken of the Hole in the Wall gang while in town. This photograph is what ultimately helped to bring down the gang because law enforcement officials now had pictures of faces to go with names. When asked why they had the photo taken that day in Fort Worth, Butch Cassidy recalled simply, We were passing the place and thought it'd be a good joke to have our pictures taken. 
The Chisholm Trail mural at 3rd and Main Street commemorates the great cattle drives that came through town in the years after the Civil War, when Fort Worth was the last major stop along the storied trail. On the west side of the city, you'll pass near the bomber plant. In World War II, B-24s and B-32 bombers were built at this U.S. government-owned facility. Today, the Lockheed Martin Company builds the F-16, F-22, and F-35 fighters at this plant. Downtown is filled with historic buildings and sites. President Kennedy gave his last speech at the Old Texas Hotel, now the Radisson Hotel, at 8th and Main Street. The Fort Worth Convention Center and the Water Gardens occupy much of the area known as Hell's Half Acre during the wild days of the frontier. A drive north from the courthouse on Main Street takes you to the Stockyards National Historic District. From the late 1800s until the 1960s, this area was one of the largest and most active stockyards in the nation. After trains reached Fort Worth in 1876, the need to drive cattle to the railheads in Kansas no longer existed. KF Line, a five-year-old boy, witnessed the first train pull into Fort Worth. He later recalled the day. My daddy or mother, neither one had ever seen a train. We made it to Fort Worth that night and camped out there on the prairie, where East Lancaster is now. There were covered wagons all over the place. Must have been a hundred at the least. It was a little old engine. The smokestack was the biggest thing about it. It had black smoke and a coarse whistle and a big bell that scared me. A drive along Exchange Avenue provides the opportunity to see many of the old buildings dating back to the days when this area was filled with cattle, hogs, horses, and mules going to market. The Cowtown Coliseum, the Fort Worth Livestock Exchange Building, the Stockyards Hotel, the White Elephant Saloon Building, and the Stockyard Station, which housed sheep and hogs, provide a real view of the Old West. Each day at 11.30 and at 4, a herd of longhorn cattle is driven along exchange where the cowboys dress in the shafts, hats, and spurs of the old cattle drive era. The Stockyards Museum, the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame, and Stockyards Trail Hall of Fame features plaques embedded in the street that honor the heroes of the Old West, provide additional historical facts about Texas and frontier days. Immigrants from across the world came to work in the historic stockyards because it was one of the largest employment centers in Texas. Many special events and activities held in the historic stockyards throughout the year celebrate Fort Worth's Western heritage, such as the Texas Frontier Forts Muster and the Red Steagle Cowboy Gathering. Before leaving Fort Worth and heading west, a drive through the area now known as the Cultural District provides additional insights into Texas history. From the historic stockyards, travel from North Main Street along Northside Drive and University to Camp Bowie, where the cultural district begins. Much of the cultural district along Camp Bowie was once the Van Zant family farm, and the family's original farmhouse still stands at the intersection of Crestline and University, across from the original location of the Casa Manana Theater. The street called Camp Bowie derives its name from the huge army camp of that name, which covered the entire area during World War I. Thousands of troops trained in this area before heading to the trench warfare in Europe. Prior to this time, the area had been home to the Indians passing along the Trinity River and later to the farmers and ranchers. The current Casa Manana Theater is located near where the original was built, and the large parking lot for the Will Rogers Memorial Center served as the grounds for the 1936 events. The federal government built the Will Rogers Memorial Center at this time through the WPA program. City philanthropist and civic leader Eamon Carter had been a close friend of Rogers and wanted to make sure the great actor-philosopher's name would be memorialized. Rogers, in many ways, incorporated the cowboy ethos of the city, the place where the West begins. Today, the Will Rogers Memorial Center is host for the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo, numerous horse and cattle events, and consumer shows. A great bronze equestrian statue of Will and his horse Soap Suds serves as a centerpiece for the district. In the same area, five major museums and a community arts center are also part of the cultural district. The Fort Worth Museum of Science and History began as a children's museum and now includes a planetarium, an omni theater, and numerous hands-on educational exhibits. 
The Eamon Carter Museum opened in 1961 and has had several expansions. Its collection includes numerous pieces of art and photography about the frontier. The National Cowgirl Museum also includes materials about the frontier and the American West. The Kimball Art Museum and the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth are both architectural gems with world-famous collections housed in architecturally significant buildings. Immediately south of these museums is the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, which includes considerable plant materials native to Texas and other beautiful flora. Only a mile south of the garden is the nationally ranked Fort Worth Zoo, which features exhibits of animal life in Texas, including the famed buffalo. Drive around to see as many of these sites as you can. And in the meantime, we hope you've enjoyed this journey back east. Thank you. 